Well, do keep uh, your Bible open at uh, that reading, Acts chapter 4. Jesus' salvation is found in no one else, Acts 4, verses 1 to 12. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we look to you for the help of your Holy Spirit now to understand your word, to understand what it meant then and what it means for us today. So we look to you now and pray for your blessing. Amen. So that final verse of the reading, verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. This is a thunderbolt statement. It was a thunderbolt when the Apostle Peter first said it, just a few days after Jesus' ascension to heaven. And it's still a thunderbolt today. The 20th and 21st centuries have seen a great loosening of uh, European, in, in European Christian heritage, in literature and politics and education. And at the same time, there's been an unprecedented movement of people around the world, um, but particularly into Europe, People have come across the decades from many nations, and thus, of course, including people of many religions. And these two aspects of 20th and 21st century cultural change have led to Peter's statement becoming highly controversial in European cultures today. His declaration is so exclusive, isn't it? Salvation is found in no one else. Your average Brit doesn't want to say that one religion is right and the other religions are wrong. Indeed, when I was coming to faith in Jesus as a teenager, this topic of Jesus being the only way to God became a big challenge to me, a big problem really, something that I wrestled with. I remember a somewhat heated discussion at school where a friend said to me, what about all the people in India? And that line stuck with me. In the year after my A-levels, I went to India for six months. And a significant part of my motivation in going there was this question about whether Jesus was the only way to God, the only way to be saved. Not only did Peter say that salvation is found in no one else, but this was Jesus' message as well. John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus famously said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. During my time in India, I was able to investigate something of the Hindu religion and of Tibetan Buddhism. I remember meeting a member of the Krishna consciousness movement commonly known as a Hare Krishna, and uh, a fellow traveler who uh, me and my friend actually teamed up with, we traveled uh, quite a bit uh, as we were going around the country, and he'd been working as a chef in a Californian New Age center and uh, had lots of extraordinary ideas. Most importantly for me, I met Indian and African Christians. I gave my first sermon and personally, I shouldn't have been allowed to do that sermon, by the way, um, and personally read more of the Bible. And I came back believing that Jesus is the only way to be saved, and it changed my life. But I recognize that Peter's statement about Jesus is a cultural thunderbolt. Salvation is found in no one else. I wonder how you feel personally about Peter's exclusive claim. Do you receive it and believe it? Perhaps you're sitting on the fence, reluctant to kind of pin your flag to the mast. Or maybe even you find it offensive. I'm sure many people in our generation do. Well, during April and May, we're going to be exploring 
the teaching of the apostles in the first chapters of the book of Acts. Interestingly, Acts is full of speeches and sermons. And David Peterson notes that a third of the book is made up of sermons and speeches. The reason for this is that Jesus is continuing his teaching through his apostles in the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts was written by Luke, the gospel writer, and it is, in a way, part two of Luke's gospel. In the Bible, John's gospel is sandwiched in the middle, but Luke's gospel and Acts really go together. Please do you turn in your Bible to the first page of the book of Acts, and we'll see how Luke begins his record of the things which the apostles did and said. That's on page 1092 in the church Bibles. So if you're able to find Acts chapter one, verse one, that'd be great. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. In my former book, writes Luke, he means what we now call Luke's gospel. And he addresses it to Theophilus, the same person that he addressed his gospel to. Um, It means lover of God. In my former book, lover of God, person who wants to know about God. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And that word began is very striking. Luke means that Jesus' activity and teaching didn't stop when he ascended to heaven. The events of Jesus' earthly life were only the beginning. And after his ascension, Jesus continued to teach through his apostles by the power and instruction of the Holy Spirit. So Acts is very much part two of Luke's gospel. They go together. As Peter begins to speak in today's reading, look at what Luke writes in chapter four, verse eight. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus' teaching is continuing through the apostles. So over the next few weeks, we're going to consider several of these early sermons. And remember that the events recorded in Acts began just weeks after Jesus' resurrection and just days after his ascension. This is the beginning of the church and shows us the message of the apostles right as it all began. It's therefore very helpful to study what the apostles taught and to compare it with what we at All Saints Church teach today. Does what they taught then match up with what we teach now? Are we remaining faithful? Do we have continuity with the apostles' message? So we do have that framework in mind today and over the coming weeks. Let's dive into today's Bible reading, Acts chapter 4, and let me set the scene. Peter and John, two of Jesus' apostles, have performed an outstanding miracle. A man who'd been lame from birth has been healed. Each day he would be carried to one of the gates leading into the Jerusalem temple, and there he would beg for money, and he was well known as a local character. Peter and John are going into the temple, and chapter 3, verse 6, records what Peter says to him. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He went through the temple courts, walking, jumping, and praising God. People recognized him as the beggar they saw every day. And a crowd gathered to find out what had happened. They were amazed. That's the context for Peter's sermon that David Banting taught on last Sunday from chapter three. And today's reading from chapter four continues just a short time after the healing of the lame man on the very same day. The priests 
and the captain of the temple guard are greatly disturbed by Peter and John. Now, it wasn't the healing that disturbed them, verse 2. It was that the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And this shows us that central to the first Christian preaching was the resurrection. So as we go back to this first preaching, we see that Jesus' resurrection was of first importance. This belief was right there at the beginning. It didn't develop later on. It didn't develop gradually over time. It was there immediately in the weeks after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. So it's, it's essential to authentic Christianity. Versions of Christianity that leave out the resurrection either Jesus' resurrection or the coming resurrection of Christian people are wonky versions of Christianity. Lloyd Webber's famous musical, Jesus Christ Superstar, leaves out Jesus' resurrection. Clangor. A recent production of Godspell that I saw omitted Jesus' resurrection. Well, that isn't right. It needs to be right there at the middle of our gospel proclamation. The temple guards seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in a lockup until the next morning. The Jewish ru rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem to discuss what to do about them. Annas, the high priest, is there, as is Caiaphas, and a number of men from the high priest's family. So these are the people who are at the center of the Jewish temple. They're the people who perform the sacrifices. They're right at the middle of the Jewish religion. Peter and John are brought out of the prison cell to be questioned. And referring to the healing of the lame man, the Jewish leaders ask, the Jewish leaders ask, by what power or what name did you do this? I hope you can see that a repeat is going on of what happened with Jesus. Jesus was arrested, so were Peter and John. Peter and John are brought before the same court that tried and condemned Jesus just a few weeks earlier. The high priest is there, as are the teachers of the law. The trial of Jesus is being reopened the evidence about Jesus is being presented to the leaders of Israel a second time. And Jesus' prophetic teaching to his apostles is coming true. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus said, when you're brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. It's coming true, isn't it? Then later on in Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you'll be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. And so you'll bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. So we see there again, Jesus' ministry is carrying on in the apostles and he's going to give them words to speak in the moment. His words are coming true and the apostles are walking the same path as Jesus. So the Jewish leaders ask, by what power or what name did you do this? And Peter's very bold in his reply. Luke writes that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 8. Rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple, 
and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Now his, his response is very interesting. Firstly, Peter notes the bizarreness of being accused and cross-examined for an act of kindness. What could be more wonderful and generous than the healing of a disabled man? Secondly, Peter is self-effacing. The healing happened in the name of Jesus Christ. Peter proclaims Jesus and gives the glory over to him. This is a good example for us to follow. In his own thinking, Peter isn't the great healer. Jesus is. And thirdly, Peter is very pointed to the Jewish leaders. He doesn't hold back, but says, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. He squarely pins the blame for Jesus' death on the people at the, mid at the middle of the Jewish culture. You crucified Jesus, God raised Jesus. And just think how this must have felt for those Jewish leaders. Just a few weeks earlier, they took Jesus to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, because they wanted to silence him. They hoped that his execution by crucifixion would put an end to him and his annoying influence. But it started again with his followers claiming that he's been resurrected from the dead. Jesus' legacy continues and it's growing. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 Jewish men put their faith in Jesus. Now, only a matter of days later, the healing of the lame man has brought a new wave of converts, growing the number of believers to about 5,000. Peter is pinning the blame for Jesus' death on uh, the high priest and his family and declaring them to be in opposition to God. And just try and get hold of that. These are the people who run the temple. And he's saying that they're opposing God. Peter continues by quoting from the Old Testament, Psalm 118, verse 22. You may recognize this verse. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, or in some translations, the cornerstone. Here, the house of Israel, the Jewish nation, is pictured as a building. And Peter is saying that Jesus is a building block that was rejected by the builders of the nation, the Jewish leaders. But in Jesus' resurrection, God has made him the most important part of the nation of Israel. The cornerstone, if you can imagine it, is, in, in your mind, is key to the foundation of a building. It's the building block on which everything else is constructed. This is Jesus, according to Peter, quoting Psalm 118. The capstone is the final stone put in place at the top of a building. This too is Jesus. Cornerstone or capstone, either way, the Jewish leaders rejected Jesus, but now God has given Jesus the place of honor by bringing him back to life from the dead. And in the context of Psalm 118, the way of righteousness has been opened up through Jesus. And the way of salvation has been opened through the, re the rejected stone, which is now being honored by God. When Peter quotes from this psalm, he makes a very small change, small but significant. He says that Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. You builders. He takes the Old Testament scripture 
right into that moment. You, Ananias, Caiaphas, John and Alexander, members of the high priest family, descended from Aaron, Moses' brother. You rejected Jesus, but God has made him the capstone by raising him from the dead. This was a thunderbolt directed at the heart of the Jewish leadership. And it comes down to who's in charge. Is it them, this lineage all the way back to Abraham, who are in charge? Well, God is actually saying it's Jesus who's in charge now by raising him from the dead. And then finally, Peter declares to them, salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So as I come to close, some applications for us today from this early apostolic message. Our mission as All Saints Church is to know Jesus and to make him known, knowing him ourselves, sharing him with others to make him known. So as we seek to spread the word of the gospel amongst our friends and our work colleagues and our acquaintances, we should make sure that our message lines up with the Apostle Peter's. So Jesus' resurrection must be central to the message we proclaim. We mustn't leave it out like Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice did in their musical. We must proclaim that the resurrection of the dead, of of, uh, Christian people, after we die, comes through Jesus. He is the way to resurrection. God has made Jesus the central person in his salvation plan. Jesus must be at the center of our message and our proclamation. Salvation is found in no one else, no other name. And this is the case, whatever nationality someone is, whatever religion they're brought up in, Salvation is found in no one else. And in this particular chapter, Acts 4, we should note that Peter and John are both Jewish. They're both Jewish followers of Jesus, who was Jewish himself. And they're telling the Jewish high priest and members of his family that salvation is found in no one else. Jesus is therefore the only saviour for Jewish people descended from Abraham. I don't know how you feel about that statement. I think when we spell it out, it's obvious from this Bible passage, but it's also quite challenging and controversial in our day. And we see that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with great boldness. In our attempts to make Jesus known, we must rely on the work of the Holy Spirit. Pray that God will fill you with his Holy Spirit to speak the gospel with boldness. Pray that God will fill our church family with his Holy Spirit, that as a community we might boldly speak the gospel. Pray that God will fill me and other people who preach and teach in our church, that he'll fill us with the Holy Spirit. And pray for Christians you know who are members of other churches and indeed in other countries. May the good news gospel of resurrection through Jesus and salvation in no other name go out from us in this year, 2024. Let's turn to prayer. I'll give you a moment of quiet for your own reflection and prayers and then I'll lead us in a prayer together.
So, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to proclaim your true gospel, the gospel of Jesus, and emphasizing the things which your apostles, Jesus' apostles, taught at the beginning. We ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit and enable us. Give us courage and desire to share the gospel. Give us boldness from your spirit to faithfully proclaim him. And we do pray that you would call people to salvation and into your kingdom through the life and ministries of our church. Amen.